Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? That's what I like to hear. Let's stand and worship. Well, I don't need the smoke or mirrors, cause I know there's a God who's real. I don't need the lights to fool me Cause I have seen the God who heals I know when I ask I'll receive it and You are not a God who withholds I hear you say just believe me I need a Holy Ghost Awakening my soul I need a love that glows Rattling my bones to the evidence show the Holy Ghost awakening in my soul. I need a heart on fire that'll never grow tired wherever I go. I need a holy, holy Ghost. I need to go. comfort cause nothing in this world remains I need something stronger than lightning but flowing inside these veins I need a Holy Ghost awakening in my soul I need a love that glows rattling my bones to the evidence show I need a Holy Awaken in my soul I need a heart on fire That'll never grow tired Wherever I go I need a Holy Holy Ghost I need a ghost Holy Holy Ghost I need a ghost You're the fire I can't even explain it It's like I'm buzzing with a heavenly language Every time I get a taste, I know I just want more, I just want more You're the kingdom that's been growing inside me It's like a large war, what's to revive me? Every time I get a taste, I know I just want more I need a Holy Ghost Awakening in my soul I need a Holy Ghost awakening in my soul. I need a heart on fire that'll never grow tired wherever I go. Sing it out. I need a Holy, Holy Ghost. I need a Ghost. Holy, Holy Ghost. I need a Ghost. Stand. Please remain standing. <laughs> Almost. I'll get See? that right one of these Almost days. Almost gotcha. And well done on the cowbell. How many people always need more cowbell? Yes? Always. Always. Join me this morning for the call to worship as together we will affirm our faith with the Wesley Covenant prayer. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours, so be it. 
and the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Now you may be seated. I tell you, if you think you don't need a Holy Ghost after you sing that song, you know you do, don't you? Amen. I love that song. Well, today, Pastor Dan is going to be preaching to us out of 2 Peter, and part of where he's going to be preaching from says this, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful that we get to add that to it? Godliness and self-control and perseverance. And we don't have to have it all right now, praise Jesus. But we get to keep adding and that helps us to grow in our knowledge and our love of God. So if you're watching online, let me just invite you today to hit your share button, your like and your share. And let's share this message today with as many people as we can because they are in need of that love as well. And we want to tell them about Jesus Christ. So be sure and hit that share. And if you're on YouTube, be sure and hit the subscribe because we don't want you to miss out on any of the videos that we put out. If this is your first time with us in person or online, or maybe you've been around a while but you just haven't connected, I want to invite you to text the word welcome to the number you see on the slide there, 937 451 3539. And we want to send you a Starbucks card to say thank you for worshiping with us, but it also will open up a line of communication. And we can help you on your journey, you can help us on our journey, and we would love to connect with you. So please be sure and text welcome to that number. And if you're here or online, be sure and text here to that number. You can also sign the red books back here, but if you text the word here, then we will send out a text asking you how we can be in prayer with you or for you and as a staff we come together and lift those prayers up and we are always honored and privileged to do that so please be sure and text here to that same number now did you see the mobile classroom the container out there does it look better amen some people worked very hard didn't they and it's looking great now we get to start painting it and make it look absolutely beautiful before we send it to the kids in Haiti so be sure to stop by the mission and ministry wall right outside here and sign up to help out on the mobile classroom. You don't want to miss out on this opportunity. You really don't. Talk to Becky. If, she, if you think you want to miss out on it, she'll convince you that you don't. She knows you want to help. And then right in between the two tables, you're going to see a, a stand that has some tags on it. You can take a tag or two or three or four and get those baby items bring them back before August 28th, and we're going to donate those to the Wesley Center for some beautiful moms who are going to have some brand new beautiful babies, so we want to help them out as well. And now it's time to give of our tithes and our offerings, which is just our opportunity to say thank you to God. When we do that Wesley Covenant prayer, we say, put us to what you will. For those good times, those are easier, aren't they? And for those times he puts us to suffering when we want to go, ah, maybe not to that, but through all of it. He is ours and we are his, and that is good news. So we want to be sure and thank God. And as you give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do it in any of these ways you see here. There's a basket on the table as you leave. But we just want to pray for just a moment to say thank you today. Father God, we are so grateful for all that you do for us. We are so grateful that you never leave us. Whether we're up or down, you are right there with us. And we are so thankful, Father. So as we give of our tithes and our offerings, we just invite you to bless them. We ask you to bless them, to multiply them, that we might be able to reach out and to tell others about you, about your love, about how we can have that knowledge and perseverance and love, Father. And we just pray right now that you would bless these gifts and that you would bless all of these givers, Father. Just rain down in abundance upon them your blessings. And we will continue to give you praise for that. In your son's holy name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Who 
by the Savior South fell fire from above I've been down to the river And I ain't the same A prodigal return I've worn shackles and chains But I've been freed and forgiven And I'm not going back And I'll never be the same Help me sing this now Oh, my hope is in Jesus Thank God that yesterday is gone, long gone. For all my sins are forgiven. Oh, oh, oh I've been washed by the blood. There's a kind of thing that breaks a man. Then it picked me up and it showed me what it means to be a man. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today and this life. We are thrilled you show up daily as we journey through every change and every season. Place within us the courage to not fear or worry about the unknown that lies ahead of us, the challenges we will face and choices we will make. Teach us how to never be fearful and forever to be faithful. You are our safe harbor, Lord. Enhance our listening skills to hear your voice amidst the fog. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. I um, uh, just didn't hear myself there a second, and I thought, am I on? Am I on? Good morning. It is great to be here, and I am uh, 
happy to just see everybody this morning. I, we are in this last sermon of a three-part sermon series called The, the World is My Parish. And um, uh, it's been kind of a combination of the, the uh, life of John Wesley combined with the words of Paul. And uh, in this last sermon on this topic, I'm going to shift that that because the life of John Wesley with uh, during the, the 17th century in the Church of England had a, all kinds of things to do with the New Testament. And, uh, and, but we're going to shift now and do the same thing with the words of Peter from the second book that, that, call, that uh, bears his name, Second Peter. And so I want to read to you just these few verses at the beginning of uh, Second Peter. And uh, I want you to hear it because Peter is writing to a church that is, has just begun but is under incredible persecution. They are they're trying to figure out their way in this whole new understanding that Jesus died for their sins, that there's new life in Christ. And he writes this. His divine power, meaning God, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them we may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. I love, I love this passage, and we're going to kind of break that down here in a few minutes John Wesley, that I've been talking about, was born in a time in the life of England where they were riding a crest of a couple hundred years of being a world power as a country. In the 1580s, I know most of you weren't born back then, the 1580s, Spain was the dominant world power. One of its crown jewels was its military might, and it was known as the Spanish Armada. It was a fleet of 130 ships that rivaled anything in the world at that time. The, through kind of a mismanaged campaign against England, they tried to, Spain tried to invade England, and the Armada was actually defeated by the English Navy, which launched England in the 1580s into the ranks of a world power. History has shown over and over again that when a country becomes a world power, with all the comforts, all the privileges that come with the, that position in the world, with no immediate hardships, or uh, the basic necessities of life are, are kind of always met, people begin to lose disciplines. They begin to lose the disciplines that in previous decades would have been part and parcel of life together. Let me give you an example. When money is scarce, when money is scarce, not just among a few of us, but generally, when money is scarce among 
all of us, then bartering becomes the normal way of giving and receiving. Does everybody know what bartering is? I have something that you need and you have something I need. And so we get together, we talk about what that is. It might be sugar, it might be flour, it might be uh, some other mechanism that we need and we just exchange. It's called bartering. Here's what it does. It brings neighbors closer. Each person knows what their neighbors have that they may need and so they, they develop a relationship over these certain things and, and, and become closer. When tragedy comes to a family, to certain families, when there is no insurance as a part of that, people band together and take care of each other's needs in that way. Joys, victories, as well as hardships and difficulties are faced together as celebration and grieving are part of life together. For people, when money is scarce, when wealth and power begin to dominate a culture, ease of attaining what a person needs changes. It changes. Distance is created between neighbors because they don't necessarily need each other to help in everyday life now. Unfortunately, the church tends to lag behind the culturalness, but they quickly catch up, and the church begins, as they catch up, they begin the disciplines and the warnings and the principles in the Bible that they have, the church begins to ease off of those principles and disciplines, just like the culture does, because everything with wealth and power is a little easier. And the church quickly catches up with the culture. It is known as the domestication of the church. This was the environment of England in the 1700s after 140 plus years of world domination. And the Church of England had slowly succumbed to that same ease of living. This was the church environment. John Wesley's new birth at Altersgate, the Altersgate experience that I talked about last week, stepped him into. He stepped into this kind of environment. The people of a culture like that, deep down, can feel the disciplines slipping away. They can feel the warnings that used to be heeded, sort of are no longer thought about. They can feel it. They talk about it at, the, at park benches. They walk down the street as they're going to get coffee together and they express their thought about it. They don't know what to do about it, but they can feel the society's disciplines that used to hold them together slipping away. John Wesley in 1738 was about to address the people of England in a way that the church had stopped doing. He was about to raise the return to historic biblical Christianity. The Apostle Peter was, had done the same thing in the first century when he wrote his second letter to the churches that had begun during that time when he said this. Now, let me break that down, that, what I read earlier. He said this to those churches. Remember, churches, when you're under persecution, when you're moving in new directions, he writes this, his divine power has given you everything you need. Let me just say that. Tip City Church, people who are attending this church, his divine power has given you everything you need. 
for a godly life through the knowledge of him who called us to it by his own gl glory and goodness. What Peter is doing is he is reminding the people, he's calling the people back to understand something very basic. All the things that you have that you run here and there and to and from and you're trying to trying to protect your time and you're you're trying to protect your family all of these things are not given by you they are given by God and he's given you everything you need so when you stand in front of your neighbor you can stand there if you are in Christ and understand I've been given Everything I need for this moment. What might you need? And when you have that attitude, which is the attitude of Christ Jesus, then you can do that. When you are, when you are in a culture that is telling you over and over again, there's something more you need. Just turn on the TV and watch one commercial. And you'll know, right? They're letting you know your life will be better if you just buy that. What Peter is saying is you have everything you need. Just like Peter was doing in this letter, John Wesley did in the 1700s. He was calling the people of England back from getting domesticated and lulled into a spiritual slumber by a culture that was experiencing temporary health, wealth, and success calling them, Wesley was calling them to reclaim the very biblical promises that they had relied on that had helped them get to that place of wealth and success. George Whitfield was a contemporary of John Wesley, and he was, a, he was a field preacher, meaning literally he preached out in the fields. And as the churches had rejected Wesley that I shared last week, where he would preach and then they'd say, you're not welcome back here to come and preach at this church anymore. As the churches had rejected Wesley, Whitfield was discovering that people would come to hear salvation and spiritual development preaching in the open air without a building. No building. They would just, they would come to hear him. George Whitfield implored John Wesley to start preaching in the fields. He would tell him, come out and just preach in the fields. But Wesley would not hear of it, insisting that preaching of the gospel had to happen in church. It was only after the rejections from church after church started for John Wesley that it forced him to consider field preaching. And when he did, when he stepped out of the church and started preaching in the streets and in the fields, the crowds were enormous. It was then that Wesley did something that George Whitfield did not do. After he would preach, John Wesley would invite the listeners to consider joining what he called a class meeting. A class meeting was a small group of people who would join together after the preaching was over and they would meet on a regular basis for encouragement and accountability in their spiritual growth. That's what it was. He was what was happening in this newly formed spiritual movement through the combination of biblical preaching and follow-up small group time was that people were reforming the bonds of trust between each other and with biblical principles. They were reforming their bond with the Word of God and they were reforming their bond with each other in small groups. You know what I'm talking about, right? Some of you have been in small groups before of, 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 where spiritual conversation was the, the, the 
the, the main thing, where you would open the Bible, you would read Scripture, you would talk about principles in it, and then you would discuss them, and you would encourage one another. What Whitfield was doing was he was just preaching. And people would come listen, and they would do like a lot of us do, right? Oh, that was a good one. Let me get my card out. That was, um, that was an 8.5, George. And hold it up, right? Some of you have done that mentally. Dan, you were lost in the bushes last week. That was a 2.1. Dan, that was a great one. That was a 9, right? There's this little internal rating system that goes on, and George Whitfield had that going. But he was good. And so his ratings were like consistently in the eights, nines. But what he didn't do, what he didn't do was what Wesley did, was he didn't care about the ratings. What he cared about was were the, were the people taking the preaching were they taking it and were they incorporating it into their life? And the way you do that is in small group. Peter continued his first century letter that gave the groundwork for what would be the aim of these small groups. What would they do in small group? What would happen? What was the flow of things that would happen in a small group setting? or as Wesley would call it, a class meeting. What would be the flow? And he wrote this, For this very reason, make every effort in your small groups, I, I'm, that's my ad addition, to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. Here's what he was doing. What Peter just did was he just gave the flow of what happens in people when they are in a small group setting. In a small group, you learn first to develop goodness. You learn it through all kinds of ways. Toward, you learn it toward each other. You, you offer each other hospitality. I, I, when I go into a small group setting and they have crackers and cheese, I'm telling you, I love them immediately. I am a crackers and cheese guy. What I see in, in, in Miss Jess's efforts with the, with the young people in our church, when she has them over to cook the very things that most of you have been eating all morning out in the gathering area, the cookies and the different things, what she's doing is she's teaching the next generation the power of hospitality. It's goodness. It is, it is learning goodness in a natural way. That's what you learn it in small groups. You come over to each other's homes and you pray for one another and you support one another. Next, you develop knowledge. You dig into the Bible together. After you've eaten and drank some stuff, you sit down and somebody opens the scriptures and, and somebody reads and then you begin to discuss you begin to ask questions about different principles found in Scripture. You move from goodness to knowledge. And you're increasing that in your life. As you grow in the Lord, the study and discussion will show you areas that you're very good at, you're very excited about in your life, growth areas. And it will show you places where you are falling short. And it calls, it, it allows you then to go, I need self-control in this area. I need humility in the areas that I'm doing, just knocking out of the park, and I need, I need courage in the areas that I need to grow up in and, and learn more about and develop self-control. Perseverance then comes through seeing these areas that need work and being in a supportive group that is cheering you on to keep developing those in your life. Where in the world do we have those places where you just come into places and, and you're, you're surrounded by people 
who know you and still love you. And are not only love, love you, but will support you and pray for you in areas that you need to work on. Perseverance. Before long, you begin to, un to see that your responses to the challenging areas in your life are more, you're, they're more and more godly responses as godliness shows up in your life. You begin to see it. Oh, I used to just bite somebody's head off when they would say that to me. Now I'm patient with them and I'm, I'm responding differently. Before long, you begin to realize that these people that you are investing in, in that small group, and that are investing in you, have become closer than family. In some cases, just closer than family. And you begin to realize that what, what the words Paul or Peter used was, there's a mutual affection. You learn how to love people beyond your family. Most of us love our family because we have to, right? But in small group, you begin to develop a mutual affection. You begin to realize they didn't have to. They didn't have to do that for me. And they did it anyway. They didn't have to pray for me. They didn't have to show up at my son's or my daughter's game. But they decided to come anyway because they, they like me. And there's a mutual affection that begins to grow in you. Then finally, you, when you're around a group of people like that for long enough, it begins to form something in you. It be, and when you're formed by a community that really cares genuinely about you, that allows you to launch into a world and bring the kind of love That changes the world. That does not demand your own rights, but that changes the world. John Wesley formed societies that were all over London, all over Oxford, all over the surrounding regions. These societies of people were made up of classes, like class meetings, these small groups, that would introduce people to this type of fellowship. And for those who desired to go further, that wanted to grow in their leadership, they, were, they would be put in what was called, what he called bands, which were groups of people that were made up of individuals who wanted to spread the movement of Wesley even farther. George Whitfield was arguably the better preacher. But toward the end of his life, he admitted that the structure that John Wesley put together was exactly what he should have done. Because it gave substance to the preaching and a place for the people to take what they were hearing and do something about it in small group. It was the combination of effective preaching and the presence of small group leaders in people's lives that was the absolute focus of the mission of the Methodist movement in the 1700s. Peter used these words, but John Wesley would have agreed with them. He said this, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, meaning the qualities that were just listed, they will, give you, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Wesleyan movement was made up of preaching and small groups. The preaching was with or without a building. It didn't matter. These people were so alive spiritually that they would have met in a cave. Some of them met in garages. They met anywhere that they could because the main point was not their comfort. The main point was that the word of God was alive in them. They, they, the, it, was, it was the preaching, in or in, not in a building, and it was small groups that met in their homes. And this combination 
lit the people of England on fire spiritually. By the mid-1700s, those Methodists were getting on ships bound for America, and the spiritual fire spread into the new world like crazy. There was nothing ineffective or unproductive about these people. While the new America was being formed and into the 1800s, here was the anticlimactic result of what had happened in England that had been stoked in England was that a Methodist church was being formed every single day for 70 plus years in England and America. And wherever those crazy Methodists would, would end up, they would just start another one because they believed in it. Interestingly enough, Peter ended his section that I've been reading of his letter almost with a warning to all of us who call ourselves Methodists or any other denomination that we come from. He says, speaking of the qualities that were being formed in people as they met in small groups together, he said this, but whoever does not have them, meaning those, those qualities, whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Here's what he was saying. If you are not in a place where those qualities are being bantered around the room and, and you're working with it, then here's the likelihood of what will happen. You will start looking at everything right in front of you, and if it doesn't meet your need in that moment, then you're, you're mad. You're disgusted. You're done with things. You're blind, is what Peter said, and you are nearsighted. Because it's those qualities that make us into godly men and women. And if we aren't subjecting ourselves to those qualities, then as easily as they came to make us effective spiritually as an individual and as a nation, they can just as easily be forgotten about and if they are forgotten about in our lives, it is to our own demise. John Wesley never intended to break away from the Church of England. A denomination who has lo lost its edge never admits it. But there, are no, there were no official bishops that would bless anything that the Methodists were doing in America. They wouldn't bless anything. They wouldn't bless the elements. They wouldn't bless the work that was going on. And the official act of a denomination to start is to have communion together. And when those who were in America that called themselves Methodists were being denied communion because they couldn't get it from an official from the Church of England, they didn't know what to do. Wesley never intended to break away, but his hand was forced. <clears throat> the Church of England would not recognize the movement. So on December 24th, 1784, John Wesley commissioned Thomas Coke to ordain Francis Asbury and it was known as the Christmas Conference of 1784. They held the first official sacramental communion service in America. And it was held at Lovely Lane Chapel in Baltimore, Maryland. And from that point on, the Methodist Episcopal Church was born. Church... Every time, as an elder of the, of the United Methodist denomination, every time I uncover these elements, I am offering you something that has been handed down to us from the upper room. 
from the moment Jesus handed this to his disciples. And when times are good, you may walk up to this table and just take bread and take juice and it doesn't mean a whole lot to you. But even in those times, you are carrying on and a linkage from Jesus to right now. When times are bad and you walk up this aisle and you receive that element, like in the time of Wesley when he, when he basically gave up his orders in the Church of England in order to bless the elements in America. When times are very risky and you take those elements, you are too carrying on the linkage. Either way, in good times or in bad times, when you receive the elements, you are saying, Jesus is the reason for our existence. Jesus is the reason that our sins are forgiven. So today, as we close out this service, and you are offered the elements, you are not offered those elements because you are a great and worthy person. You are offered those elements because our King and our Lord offered them to the men that were around him, regardless of the fact that he knew that they were all going to run in the hours ahead. They were going to run and scatter and, and declare that they did not even know him. It did not matter. He offered it to them. Because he loved them as he loves us. So on the night that he was betrayed, he took this bread and he looked him right in the eye. And he said, take this. This is my body, which is broken for you. Take it. And every time you eat it, remember me. And after supper, he took the cup. And he blessed it and he and he, he said, take this. This is my blood. It's the blood of the new covenant. The new covenant that I just told you about. To love people as I have loved you. Do this in increasing measure. Allow that to become part of your life. And as you take it, understand... Your sins are as far as the east is from the west. You take this and drink it for the forgiveness of those sins. You're still on the team. The whiteboard is empty. There are no sins that keep you from my presence. That's who our God is. Would you bow in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, I don't fully understand even to this day every time I take communion I don't fully understand because I don't fully understand how much you love me but I do understand that you've commanded me to keep coming back to this table and one day whether in this life or the next I will fully understand you will open my eyes. And I am so thankful. Lord, open our hearts and minds and prepare us for this table. And keep close to us the words your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
with those who are serving communion, if you would come forward and, and take your place at the, at the tables. We're gonna, I'm going to ask that those who are, we'll start from the back, and if you would just come down the, the center aisle and then come back around, we have something that we want to talk about at the end of the service. If you'll come down, take communion, and then return to your seat. This table is open to everyone. You may come.
It's reaching far beyond the Milky Way It's joining with the sound Come on, let's sing it out As the music of the universe plays We're singing you just a second. I want to share with you, last week I, I shared that uh, we as a congregation are moving toward a congregational vote in terms of some denominational uh, uh, relationships that we have. And, uh, and some asked if, if, do you have to be a member? Yes, you have to be a member to be in that vote. And so I want to invite you to, if, if you're not sure if you're a member, you can text this number and the word uh, the word member and uh, find out you can just call into the church office and ask for Bronwyn and um, uh, and you can find out whether you're a member or not so uh, uh, take time to do that and if you have any questions about that I'd be glad to uh, try to help you out and answer that next week we begin a new series that I I am like been thinking about for a long long time and uh, it's called origins and it's on the book of genesis of uh, genesis 1 2 3 and 4 anton Wu is going to be preaching uh the first one and if you know anything about anton that scientist the genesis 1 is just that's kind of his that's his, he's a homeboy right there in that that chapter and and um uh, so that's going to be great Listen to this uh, little video.
it's going to be it's going to be a blast, and I I am so excited about it. I hope you come back.